Firstly, a very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It once again gives me an immense pleasure to be right here at the day two of Electronic Rocks 2014. So, as we move uh, without wasting any bit of time, I would like to call our first speaker for the day, ladies and gentlemen. It's my honor to welcome Dr. Jim Lansford. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jim Lansford is a fellow in the Global Standards Group at Cambridge Silicon Radio, responsible for Wi-Fi standards and strategy. He has over 30 years of experience in communication systems, digital signal processing and strategic business development. He has been chief technology officer of three wireless startups and has held senior technical positions at Harris and Intel Corporation. Dr. Lansford was formerly the co-chair of 802.15.3a as well as a former chair of 802.19 within IEEE 802. Dot, and currently he is the vice chancellor of the wireless next generation standing committee ladies and gentlemen today dr jim will speak on the topic the future of the connected cars wireless on wheels it's our honor to have him here so let's clap really loud and welcome the gentleman on stage thank you testing 1 2 3 Do we have audio? Ah, there we go. All right, full screen. And there we go. All right, so start clicker. Very good. All right, thank you and good morning. Good morning, Bengaluru. Good morning. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm very glad to be here, and uh, I want to thank the uh, event sponsors for inviting me to be with you today. Uh, I, I'm also a part-time university professor, which means I can't stand behind a lectern. I have to wander around the stage. So you'll, you'll have to bear with me as I, uh, as I talk this morning. So as you mentioned, I, I'm uh, in, in the Global Standards Group at Cambridge Silicon Radio, or CSR as we're known these days. Uh, but I also chair the Wi-Fi Alliance Automotive Task Group. So all of the things we're working on in the Wi-Fi Alliance having to do with Wi-Fi and, and automobiles is within the group that I chair. And I'm also chair of an 802.11 group that's looking at coexistence between DSRC, which I'll talk about later on in the talk, and um, uh, our standard Wi-Fi 802.11. So very exciting times for Internet of Things and for connectivity in general. But in particular for automobiles, we're putting a lot more intelligence now in the car than we ever have. Uh, and, and what I tell my friends is that, uh, that we're making the cars a lot more intelligent. We're not making the drivers any more intelligent. They're still about the <laughs> their drivers are about as intelligent as they've always been, maybe less so. Um, <clears throat> and I'm not going to comment about drivers in, in uh, uh, Bangalore. But well, <laughs> it's, cra it's crazy traffic here. Yesterday it took me an hour to get from my hotel here. So I, you have my sympathy. And, and uh, I know this uh, today is not as bad as yesterday, so fortunately. Hopefully, you had an easier time getting here. Uh, some of you may be familiar with CSR. Some of you may not. So it, for those of you who are not familiar with CSR, I thought I'd spend one slide talking a little bit about the company. We were founded in 1998 as Cambridge Silicon Radio. Uh, but today, we're, we're just, we've shortened that to CSR. It's like Kentucky Fried Chicken and KFC, I guess. So <clears throat> because we're not just a wireless company anymore. We do. Certainly, we still do a lot of wireless, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and, and GPS, uh, but we do platforms as well, where we combine wireless technologies with other things. Uh, we, were, we went through what's called a flotation in 2004, so we are one of the few Bluetooth-oriented com uh, companies. We started out as a Bluetooth company and then diversified, uh, but we were one of the few Bluetooth startups that actually went through a flotation. And since that time, then we've diversified into the GPS market, We've gotten more involved in audio, uh, and then we've also, with our Zoran merger in 2011, uh, gotten more into imaging and video. So we, as a company, have a pretty broad portfolio in, I guess, what you'd call media. Uh, audio, video, uh, imaging, uh, and the wireless technologies that enable them, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, GPS. Um, and, and in particular, in Bluetooth, I think we're probably most well known. We have a very large market share uh, in the Bluetooth headset market. We've shipped over 2 billion Bluetooth chips. 
as a company, which is a very impressive feat over the last 15 years, really, to have shipped that many uh, Bluetooth chips. So, uh, but we're also very heavily involved in Wi-Fi for automotive, which is one of the reasons why I work in that field a good bit. And we're also very uh, active in, this, in the GPS market. And we sell a lot of GPS into automotive products as well. So that's CSR. So today I'm here to talk about the connected car. Um, so the, the trend is to add more and more connectivity to the automobile, to allow the automobile to have more sensors and sense things around it, to communicate with cars around it, to communicate with infrastructure and, and other Wi-Fi or uh, other infrastructure like traffic lights and things like that around it. And also to have, there's also things we already know about in the car, cellular technology, uh, NFC perhaps will be used in cars, near field communications. Uh, we have a lot of cars that have satellite radio, either uh, in the US, the uh, uh, XM or Sirius it's called, in Europe, digital audio broadcasting. Uh, and then we have our traditional AM and FM broadcast stations. For vehicles, electric vehicles, we'll have wireless charging. And then finally, uh, as we move more toward cars that can sense what's around them, we'll have radar and sonar. I'm not going to talk about sonar, but I will mention a little bit about radar as a, a part of autonomous vehicles. So there are a lot of wireless technologies. If you think about it, all of these are, are RF technologies, radio frequency technologies. Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, notice they share the same frequency band. Uh, DSRC is going to be a, a slightly above the Wi-Fi bands in 5 gigahertz. Uh, and then cellular is all over the place. There are numerous cellular bands, and that varies somewhat by country. but we certainly know there are five main GPS, I mean, uh, GSM and LTE bands. Um, NFC has some different frequencies, quite often typically very much lower frequency. Uh, and then um, the other frequencies, wireless charging is usually very low frequency. Radar is typically very high frequency, like 28 gigahertz. So something very much higher than what we would use for communications in a vehicle. Uh, with the exception of 802.11 AD, the 60 gigahertz technology, which it will be some time, I think, before we see in cars. So these are the wireless technologies that, we, that are already in or will be in the vehicle. It's a very complicated environment. We have all of these technologies are going to have to be operating either inside or right around a big chunk of steel with glass, some glass portals on it. So inside the car, we have a very severe interference environment, potentially. We have a lot of RF technologies that are dumping RF energy inside the car, and then we'll be radiating RF energy around the car. So it's a fairly stringent and a very demanding environment. And when you go to design products for an automobile, for the automotive market, you have to be able to take that into account. That unlike a consumer electronics product for the home, we're dealing with something that's operating inside a Faraday cage, almost. It's inside a, a metal, big steel box. And that changes the things you have to do and the way you do the engineering. So I'll spend a, a little bit of time talking about Bluetooth. Uh, obviously, that's, a big, that's something that's very important to us as a company. Um, and we believe that some of the sensors inside a car may actually m migrate toward Bluetooth. Uh, if you look at the amount of cabling, the amount of wiring that goes into a vehicle, uh, most car companies would like to reduce the weight that, is, uh, that the wiring harness uh, has in the car. One way to do that is to use more wireless technologies as long as they can meet the requirements for, for uh, whatever the sensor has to do. So for example, uh, a, a, a backup camera might just, use, might just have to supply power to a backup camera, uh, and then it would use Wi-Fi to, uh, to send the video signals from the backup camera to the, uh, uh, to the head unit so you can see what you're backing up into. That way you would avoid having to run a video grade cable all the way from the back of the vehicle up to the head unit. So that's one example. Other examples are key fobs, which are outside the car. So that's certainly a case where today everything, all those key fobs are used proprietary wireless. You could imagine having Bluetooth low energy as a standardized way. And one of the things about standards is standards tend to drive costs down and allow multi-vendor interoperability. So you can create an ecosystem that has lots of different companies involved. So those are outside the car or in, inside the engine uh, compartment. 
Inside the car, there's certainly a lot of potential things that could be, that Bluetooth could be used for, in addition to having just the smartphone communicate with the, uh, the head unit in the car. And so uh, there, these are some examples of things that, uh, temperature sensors inside the car, things that the user might be wearing, like a health monitor or, or uh, something like that. We, we're going to see a lot of applications of uh, health devices that use Bluetooth low energy. Um, and in, then, of course, we've just seen the recent uh, launch of the Apple iWatch, or that they really haven't launched it, I guess. They've just mentioned, said they're, when they're going to launch it. But it has both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth uh, low energy in it. Uh, so you could imagine that s many of these kinds of wearable devices could start interacting with your car in ways that you know perhaps some of you will come up with some really killer apps for. Uh, I don't think today we use. I, I view wireless technology as an enabler. So Wi-Fi and Bluetooth enable things, and people that are very creative and want to go uh, come up with some bright ideas and some brilliant ideas to create a new product and help build a new market can leverage that existing technology and use it. So cars will have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth in them. You could develop a product that interacts with a car in ways that nobody's thought of before and help and start your own, uh, start your own uh, startup. <clears throat> I mentioned the wiring harness earlier. Obviously, if you look at the steering wheel of a lot of cars, there, there's all kinds of buttons now that we put on the steering wheel. Uh, to control the audio system, or control the, the uh, phone system, or cruise control, or other kinds of functions. Clearly, it, that wiring harness that goes up into the steering wheel is fairly complicated because it has to be able to spin with the steering wheel. Uh, and there's a lot of signaling that goes on. So it, might act, it would be advantageous to use a wireless technology instead of a wire technology for something that's moving like that, like the steering wheel. So that's certainly one idea that some car companies are exploring, is using something like Bluetooth as a way to uh, control devices from the steering column. And with Bluetooth low energy, the power consumption is so low uh, that you could go for years without having to replace the battery, or you could use energy harvesting. So there's something, uh, you know, either a photocell or uh, a thermocouple or uh, some sort of way of uh, harvesting energy to provide power for the battery, and that's certainly a very viable, and we expect to see a lot of our customers using BLE with energy harvesting techniques. I mentioned health. Obviously, it's interesting to think about having your car monitor your health, but that's what could be enabled by having these uh, Bluetooth in. We have Bluetooth today, and Bluetooth today in most cars is just used for audio, you know, listening to music go from your phone or uh, you might make a phone call over Bluetooth in your car. But imagine, uh, as uh, in the future, uh, there's even been an article, there's an article about Ford and GM wanting to look at the health of the driver. So imagine having your car that could tell if you're not feeling well, or if you're running a temperature and you might be getting sick, and, and uh, ask you about things. Uh, for example, if someone has diabetes and their, their blood sugar level is dropping, if they have a we expect to see diabetes monitors that use BLE. Well, if your car could also sense that, in addition to your smartphone, your car could know if your blood sugar is getting too high or too low and be uh, able to kind of give you a warning to say you might want to pull over. These are the kinds of things that could be enabled when you have the car connected to the driver. Because we know that there are going to be a lot of things that use uh, a lot of body sensors that are connected to smartphones. There's no reason those same sensors couldn't be connected to the head unit of the car. So your car is also giving you that information. If the battery in your phone is dead or your phone is, you've got your phone stuck in your bag, there's no reason your car couldn't give you the same kind of information that your phone would. Another area that I think is probably already, is already shipping, just using proprietary technology, is a tire pressure monitoring system. And those have been mandatory in the United States now for a number of years. Uh, and from uh, in Europe, they're about to be mandatory. And that's something that, again, having something that's standards-based would allow interoperability between vendors. Um, as it stands today, there's no, uh, there's no common technology that people use for TPMS, tire pressure monitoring system. So if you, if you standardized on something like Bluetooth Low Energy for TPMS, then it would allow you to mix tires and wheels uh, with, from different car vendors and not have to worry about interoperability issues. 
So that's Bluetooth. So another area, and again one that I spend a lot of my time working on, is Wi-Fi in the car. And this is an exciting area. We're just starting to see now, this, in the past year, we're starting to see companies put Wi-Fi in vehicles. And the way I look at it is that if you look at the history of Wi-Fi, we started out with laptops connected to access points. That was it, right? I mean, we had Centrino from Intel. But we have a lot of technologies, a lot of companies that have made chipsets for wireless LAN. But it all started out kind of with laptops talking to access points. And then <clears throat> when we started the smartphone rev revolution, all the smartphones started out shipping with wireless LAN in them. And they would also connect to access points. Again, it's kind of a client server architecture. And then we saw that some of the smartphone vendors started putting in peer-to-peer -peer connectivity, Wi-Fi Direct. Um, uh, TDLS, Tunnel Direct Link Setup. These are technologies that are used to allow peer-to-peer -peer connections between uh, devices, particularly to, between two smartphones. If you wanted to share pictures, you wanted to share uh, different kinds of files, you could use a peer-to-peer -peer technology. And we've also seen a very big move over the last several years to start putting Wi-Fi in <coughs> consumer electronics devices, televisions, Blu-ray players, uh, set-top boxes. We're seeing a big move now to add uh, Wi-Fi connectivity to these tr traditional consumer electronics devices so you can surf the web from your TV. Well, the next frontier, the next logical place is what I call the fourth screen, the, the display in your car. And the picture I show here is the Tesla. Tesla is fairly unique in that it has a huge touch screen in it, a 17-inch diagonal touch screen in the cockpit. All the controls are soft controls. If you want to turn, control the stereo or the sunroof or, or whatever on the Tesla, it's all done using software from that touchscreen. <clears throat> Which means they also can do over-the-air software updates. I have to tell you a funny story. In fact, a friend of mine actually owns a Tesla and he was having a problem with something. It wasn't working right. So he calls up the Tesla uh, customer service line and they said, oh yeah, there's a, there's a bug in that. And so they said, if you could, you know, as soon as you can pull over, let us know. So he pulls over the side of the road. Over the air, over the cellular network, they downloaded a software update to his car, and he rebooted it and took off down the road, and they fixed his problem. It's a pretty amazing thing to think about, having to re for number one, having to reboot your car. <laughs> but, but to be able to say, I'm having a problem with my car, and they give you an over-the-air software update to your car to, to get you on, going on down the road. So... It's a, it's a very interesting, Tesla is a very interesting company. And I, I, I'm not just giving them a plug for that reason. Actually, my son works for Tesla he, on their software <laughs> team. So he, he tells me there's all kinds of cool stuff they're working on that he can't tell me about. Uh, they just announced, I think a couple of days ago, some autopilot functions for, for the Tesla Model S. Uh, basically using radar and ultrasonics and other uh, technology to, where they're trying to get to is you basically get in a lane not in Bangalore, though. You could never do this in Bangalore, but, but, <laughs> but you get in a lane <laughs> in, in a city where there are actually stripes on the road that people stay inside. And, <laughs> and uh, you, you press a button, and the thing will keep you in that lane. It'll look for cars all around you and warn you if cars are coming into your lane. And it'll keep distance between you and the cars in front and behind you. Uh, intelligent cruise control is another way to think of this, but it's, also intel it's not just speed. It's also keeping you in lane. So it's an exciting time, and I'll talk a little bit more about autonomous vehicles toward the end. But, but this is the trend in automobiles. Again, to make the car smarter, especially when the driver isn't smarter. So if it, uh, I'll, and I'll talk about that when I talk about DSRC. That if a driver's not paying attention and impaired, a smarter car means a safer car. So in the Wi-Fi world, we talk a lot about the use cases for Wi-Fi in the car. Um, they really fall into two main categories. One is, I guess, what you would call internet connectivity, either from your phone with your existing data plan connecting into the car, or uh, having a cellular modem built into the car. And uh, in either case, what you're doing is you're basically connecting the car to the cloud, the internet, uh, to be able to download content, upload status of the car. If there's a check engine light that comes on your car, it could send a signal to the dealer saying, you know, saying, you know, call me if there's a problem. Uh, like my friend with the Tesla, you know, having, if the, there's a problem that pops up, you could uh, have it contact customer service and download a software update. Th 
things like that. The other class of use cases is what I call screen mirroring. And we don't see that a lot yet, but you're going to see that over the next several years. And that is your smartphone is a little screen, apparently getting bigger with the iPhone 6. But, but still, it's a fairly small screen. And you have a much bigger screen in the cockpit. If you have a Tesla, you have a huge screen. But, but even so, even most regular cars, the screen is quite a bit bigger. So imagine having the screen on your smartphone being mirrored on a bigger screen in your car, either in the passenger seats or on the driver. It's called screen mirroring. It's coming to a car near you, and you'll see it. The use case, the, this use case, this picture here actually shows a use case. I guess this isn't a laser. I do have a laser over here in my bag, but uh, imagine that I'll just stand here and do it. So let's say that you've got your Google Maps, and I, I do this a lot. I'll go rent a car when I go to a business meeting. I have no idea how to work the GPS system inside that car, and I don't really want to, for the two hours I'm going to have this rental car, I don't really want to learn how to use the GPS system. In it. But I know how to use Google Maps in my phone. So I'll bring up Google Maps on my phone, punch in where I want to go, but now I've got this little phone laying on the seat over there that I can't really look at while I'm driving. But with screen mirroring, I can have the display in the car create the exact replica of what's on my phone. And so now it looks like I'm running the Google Maps app on the head unit, even though it's really just running on my phone. So I'm creating a mirror image, a screen replica, on the screens in the car. And I can do that in any screen in the car. If there's a screen in the back seat, so let's say that one of my kids wants to watch a movie that's on my phone or on a tablet. I can, do, I can mirror the screen from my phone to the screen in the back. Or um, a similar related use case is I've got a movie stored in my head unit of the car and one of the kids in the back seat wants to watch it, either on the screen in front of them or on their tablet. I can also stream media content from the head unit to either the in-seat screen or their, their uh, mobile device, their tablet. Or so <clears throat> it's really expanding the entertainment options. That's one part of that use case. And the other one is allowing me to have the apps that are running on my phone appear in a more convenient place for me on a bigger screen so I can use them down the highway. And that's mostly navigational aids. We actually in the Wi-Fi Alliance have uh, the, the Japanese companies especially are very keen. You really don't want a driver doing a lot of stuff on the phone while they're driving down the road. So, so there are uh, going to be restrictions on the kinds of things that the head unit will let you do uh, while you're driving down the highway at 100 kilometers an hour for good reasons. <clears throat> so speaking of the Japanese companies, uh, there's a group of Japanese companies called the Japanese... Uh, Automotive Software Platform and Architecture Group, JASPAR. Uh, and they've been very, very active in the Wi-Fi Alliance. And so they've got a number of use cases that they talk about uh, for how they view the car of the future to be connected. Uh, and this just shows some examples of that. And it really kind of highlights some of the things I was just talking about. I'll come over here and talk to this side of the room. Uh, the rear camera, the rear seat screens, talking to a hotspot, having a cellular modem that communicates with 3G or LTE, having a smartphone tether to the head unit, having a DVD or Blu-ray player that can stream content to other screens in the car, streaming audio inside the car, streaming audio or video to a tablet inside the car, or playing a ga video game in the car. <clears throat> and I can tell you from experience, if you have children in the back seat, small children, and you're on a five-hour drive, it's really nice for them to be able to play video games or watch movies. You really don't want them to get bored uh, and bug, the, bug you for five hours. It's good to keep them busy. <clears throat> this shows a kind of another pictorial way of putting that. And I, I use this picture kind of to show you that the in-vehicle infotainment system, the IVI system it's called, and that's what this picture shows, this IVI device is the head unit, uh, or the in-vehicle infotainment system, is actually going to be part of an overall automotive bus. Today we have a number of buses inside the car, CAN bus, uh, a couple others, 
but there's also going to be a lot of companies moving toward a twisted pair Ethernet backbone in the car as well. And we expect to see that this IVI device would be connected to that backbone as well. And that allows some kind of interesting, having a wired backbone allows some interesting things as well, where if you use twisted pair Ethernet, you could have the option of doing some things wirelessly or some things wired, and they would all be Ethernet based. After all, Wi-Fi is wireless Ethernet, so the software stacks are very similar. Not exactly the same, but very similar. Um, but that allows you then to put the, the navigation DVD in, in, in the back of the car inside the boot um, and have it be able to connect over a bus to the IVI if you don't really need to change that navigational DVD very often, which that's the way it is in my wife's car. The navigational DVD is way back in the back of the car. <clears throat> um, I'll talk more about infrastructure stuff in a few minutes when I get to DSRC. So there is going to be this idea of having a vehicle network, vehicular area network, if you want to call it that, where we'll have wired and wireless technologies all operating inside the vehicle uh, over a, uh, a network backbone. So you're going to have to have an IT person for your car. <laughs> Won't that be fun? It's funny, there are, the companies that, there are a lot of companies involved in our Wi-Fi group, General Motors, Ford, Nissan, Honda, uh, Toyota. Um, we have some involvement from Mercedes, and, and it's, it's interesting. They say, you know, if somebody buys a new phone and they can't get it to work with their car, they take their $30,000 car back to the dealer to fix the problem with the $300 phone. And it's the phone's problem. The phone has had a software problem and it doesn't talk to the car properly. They find that really annoying. This is one of my favorite use cases. I kind of like this one. So you're, you're driving your car, you drive up to the petrol station. And you, when you pull into the petrol station and you're filling up your car with petrol, you can also fill up your, um, your hard disk or your, uh, your memory with movies and music. So while you're stopped at the, the petrol station, you can fill up with petrol and fill up with media at the same time. If you have a fast enough Wi-Fi connection, you can download a one a gigabyte uh, MP4 file in just a couple of minutes. Why not? And I think this is going to be an interesting, the reason I thought of this is that in Korea, SK Telecom owns a bunch of gas stations. So for them, it's a natural thing to combine Wi-Fi connectivity with a, <laughs> with a petrol station. So um, th for them, it would be a natural business model to pull into the petrol station, you have an account with them, you pull up an applet uh, and, and download a, a movie while you're putting in your petrol in your tank and it comes on the same credit card because it's the same company that owns the petrol station and is your telecom provider. That's Korea, but you can imagine something similar happening lots of other places. And again, I, it, it, there are examples, certainly in the U.S., of people like Netflix and Redbox and things like that providing this inst, you know, connectivity uh, uh, or media downloads on the, on the fly. Another thing that we're doing in the Wi-Fi group is wireless USB. Actually, we call it wireless serial bus. It's not called wireless USB, but I put this as wireless USB so it would be familiar to you. So basically, we would take the existing USB stacks and run them over a Wi-Fi physical layer, or lower layers. And that allows you, <coughs> for the most part, to be able to run USB peripherals over a Wi-Fi connection in the car. And there's actually on Monday, I, I fly from here to Berlin, and on Monday we're having an automotive summit, a Wi-Fi automotive summit, and there'll be a demonstration of this. We're going to have General Motors and Qualcomm demonstrating running serial bus, USB, wireless USB, over Wi-Fi to connect to devices on the head unit of the car. So this is actually a technology that the Wi-Fi Alliance is working on, and we expect to see uh, showing up in cars in the next year or two. Another thing, another thing that uh, I think has gotten a lot of interest is <clears throat> when you get into a vehicle and it has Bluetooth and it has Wi-Fi, um, several of the car companies have complained to us, CSR, because we do both Wi-Fi and Bluetooth for cars, why do we have to go through and pair Bluetooth and then we turn around and associate to Wi-Fi? Why can't we just have one way of connecting to everything all at once? Um, and Certainly, we're working on solutions for that. We have, we have a Bluetooth LE solution that we, we kind of like. Uh, but the idea is you do it one time. You get in your car with your smartphone, 
you go through one pairing operation, I call it unified pairing, where we establish credentials for Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Energy, and Wi-Fi all at once. And it's not just Wi-Fi infrastructure, but Wi-Fi Direct for Wi-Fi Display, Miracast it's called. We do all of those credentials using a BLE connection so that it simplifies things for the user. You do it one time, you get all the credentials and, and all the association and pairing for everything in one operation. Now, Bluetooth Low Energy is one way to do it. You could certainly imagine there might be other ways of doing it. You could do it with NFC, for example. Uh, and that's been discussed as well. The only thing about NFC in a car is <clears throat> you would actually have to go to the expense of adding an extra NFC uh, receiver or NFC transponder in the cockpit that would be rarely used. So it would be something that an OEM, the car company, would have to spend money for but only get used maybe a few times a year. So they don't usually like to spend money for things that are rarely used in the car. Bluetooth is something, however, we would use all the time. So it would already be there. So that's unified pairing. The next thing I want to talk about, and I'm doing my time check here to make sure we're okay, is dedicated short-range communications. Now this is an interesting and pretty exciting area. And here's, here's the scenario I want to paint for you. Imagine having every vehicle on the highway sending out a little beacon 10 times a second that says, here's where I am, here's the direction I'm headed, here's how fast I'm going, Here's what I'm doing. Here's the position of my steering wheel. Am I applying my brakes? Am I not applying my brakes? It's basically having every vehicle broadcast a fair amount of information about its state. Its state. So in other words, position, velocity, things that are going on inside the car. To all the cars around you for 400 meters. And doing this 10 times a second. So this is, this is a very interesting area because basically it says, we, we've already heard about radars and things like that, and I'll, I'll mention that a little later, but radar can only see the immediate things around you. You can only see the vehicle in front of you or behind you or on, thing on either side of you. With DSRC, you can actually see 400 meters in all directions. You'll be getting signals, these broadcast signals, from 400 meters all around you. So as a car, Inside the car, I can be tracking all sorts of vehicles around me to see, are they going to hit me? Uh, are they slowing down? Are they speeding up? Uh, but the big one is, are they going to hit me? And so there's a lot of software that's been developed now to predict, based on all this information the car is collecting, is somebody going to hit me? So that's, that spectrum has already been allocated in the U.S. We've al it's already gone through field trials. Uh, and in 2016, uh, the U.S. government is going to announce the rules for how that they will roll this out as a mandatory technology for all new vehicles sold in the U.S. And Europe is probably not far behind. Uh, the Europeans have similar spectrum allocated for the identical same technology. It's built on 802.11p. Uh, again, I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, and it allows this standardized way for vehicles to all communicate with each other. And there are a lot of different message types that vehicles will be able to send and receive, mostly send, but also receive, that, that can be used by DSRC. So there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of software stacks that are defined and a whole bunch of message types that are defined that do these kinds of things. And probably the one, most critical one is this emergency warning system. It basically says someone is coming at you and there's no way to avoid a collision. And in some cases, it will trigger automatic braking, in fact, so it automatically stops the car before your collision. So even if you don't see the car, if your car senses that it can't avoid, that it's better brake now or it's going to collide, it will go ahead and apply the brakes for you. Uh, but th there's all si sorts of other convenience functions, like these cooperative adaptive cruise control, um, emergency vehicles, um, electronic parking payments, toll collection, um, I guess there's, 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 quite a, there's dozens and dozens of message types that are defined in this standard. It actually uses 802.11p at the lower layers, and then something called IEEE 1609 above that that defines some of the message formats. And then the message types, these things, are defined by an SAE standard, J2735. So if you're interested, you can go Google those and track those down to get all the details. But this technology is coming, and it's, it's a a very interesting and exciting technology. And this sort of shows <coughs> the idea is 
there's two kinds of connectivity here, vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure. So imagine having every car, and this of course will be primarily intended, the mandate will be for all new cars. All new cars sold in the US will have to have DSRC. Uh, but there'll also be an aftermarket. So you could buy one of these DSRC modules for your existing car and stick it on the dashboard and it would send out those same signals. In addition, you could buy these devices for your scooter or your bicycle or for you as a pedestrian and it would warn vehicles that you're there. So if you're riding a, your, a bicycle at night, if, even if the driver doesn't see you, the DSRC beacon would warn your car that you're there and it would warn you to steer around the bicycle or pedestrian. So there's going to be an interesting aftermarket for things that aren't cars, that aren't built into cars, for these kinds of DSRC systems. So that's vehicle to vehicle. There's another part of DSRC called vehicle to infrastructure. So they have defined message types for transmitters to be located at intersections or where they're doing construction or for that matter emergency vehicles or to warn you of hazards, they will transmit messages to your car using the same message types, the same technology, but it will send messages to your car to warn you. So you're in this nice cocoon of a car that's keeping all the external sound out so you don't hear the ambulances or whatever, but this goes inside the car and alerts you on the screen in the car flashes a light. Even Ford and some other companies have looked at even having a vibrator, vibrating thing in your car that buzzes your legs or your back to let you know, that, uh, to warn you that there's a hazard and you need to, to do something. <clears throat> so these are roadside to car kinds of things that will warn you of things on hazards on the roadside, such as construction or a road closed or an accident or whatever that's ahead. And these would be done by vehicle, by emergency vehicles typically. <clears throat> Another application of DSRC is for traffic control, that obviously having cars all relay their position and speed to tr infrastructure will allow smarter traffic lights. You could actually do a more intelligent traffic flow monitoring if you knew, it's kind of like crowdsourcing, think about it. It's, it's like crowdsourcing the traffic patterns where all the cars are transmitting to the, uh, the infrastructure saying this is how fast I'm going, so there's, there's congestion here. And assuming the people that operate the traffic lights actually are forward thinking enough, they could build a computer system that more optimally manages traffic flow based on real-time traffic data. That's all available through VDSRC. How long that takes to get built out is anybody's guess, but it's, a, it's something that DSRC enables. So just to kind of give you sort of a, a, a requirement summary, and I'm not going to get into a lot of technical detail in this talk, DSRC is designed to handle speeds up to 200 kilometers per hour. So 400 kilometers per hour, what's called closing speeds. So two cars going 200 kilometers an hour headed toward each other. It's designed to handle those kinds of speeds. You can have hundreds of vehicles in a parking lot or uh, on a congested highway at the same time. Uh, response times, as I mentioned, every vehicle transmits out every 100 milliseconds. So you get basically 10 times a second, an update for every car. Uh, so for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle applications, typically it's 400 meters of coverage. For emergency vehicles, you may get a kilometer of coverage. So an ambulance be able, will be able to send out these beacons and alert cars for up to a kilometer around it that there's an emergency vehicle coming, here's the direction it's heading, and your car will actually be able to tell you there's, there's an ambulance behind you, you need to pull to the right or to the left. Um, <clears throat> And this technology has been a long time coming. They've, they've actually started working on it more than 12 years ago. Uh, but it's, it's finally coming to the point now where in 2016 we'll see the, uh, the mandate formalized and then we'll start to see this appearing in cars in the U.S. as a mandate shipping around 2018, 2019. So what are the benefits of this? Well, you know, in the U.S. anyway, in 2011, there were 5 million car crashes and 30,000 people were killed, and 2 million injuries. And obviously those have a lot of cost to society. You lose productivity, there's all sorts of, um, I mean, if somebody dies, that's, that's particularly catastrophic. And the idea is that about 80% of these crashes are, uh, could be prevented if the driver had better awareness of what's going on or the driver was less impaired, distracted, whatever. 
Um, so the US DOT did a study that says that DSRC should be able to reduce, mitigate, or prevent 80% of crashes by impaired drivers. Now most, the majority of crashes are caused by a driver not paying attention or being impaired for whatever reason, uh, alcohol, sleepiness, whatever. So the, the idea is if we make the vehicle smarter, if we make the vehicle smarter, the driver doesn't have to be smarter. The driver doesn't have to be more alert. So we'll let the vehicle get more intelligent to reduce the number of crashes. And it will save society a lot of cost and a lot of heartache uh, and a lot of tragedy in the process. So the details of V2V really are that, as I mentioned, we send out these basic safety messages. It's called a BSM. These are normally sent out about 10 times a second. They use a version of 802.11 Wi-Fi called 802.11p. It's in a 10 megahertz wide channel. It uses the same OFDM. In fact, if you know Wi-Fi at all, if you know 802.11, 802.11 is the 5 gigahertz version of IEEE 802.11. Uh, it's actually a version of 802.11a that operates in the 5.9 gigahertz band. That's what 11p is. So the same radio, in fact, uh, a lot of the field trials have been done with an Atheros chip that was designed to support uh, the Japanese 802.11J band, and that's 10 megahertz wide, but they retuned the chip up to 5.9, and it works just fine. So the underlying technology for DSRC is Wi-Fi. It's a 10 megahertz wide Wi-Fi, but it's Wi-Fi, which means that we have some interesting possibilities to allow some uh, uh, complementary technology development. Uh, and in particular, I'm uh, chairing this group that's trying to figure out, can Wi-Fi and DSRC share the same spectrum, since they both are first cousins and can sense each other? And so we're exploring that as a regulatory thing right now. The FCC has proposed allowing Wi-Fi to share the band with DSRC, since Wi-Fi can detect the presence of DSRC at very low levels and get out of its way. I mean, obviously, DSRC is about preventing collisions, so you don't want the, the fact that you're watching a movie in the car to interfere with the collision avoidance system. So you have to get out, you have to make sure you don't interfere with the collision avoidance system. <clears throat> so, so the question is, won't reliability be an issue? You know, I t as I mentioned, I teach a class, the Wi-Fi class at University of Colorado Boulder. And I tell my students that quality of service in wireless is an oxymoron, right? You really can't ever guarantee not five nines reliability in any wireless link, as much as you'd like to. So there is some inherent unreliability in wireless. The thing about DSRC is it is a, it is a licensed spectrum. So there's not microwave ovens there. There's no military radars there. There's no Bluetooth there. There's no cordless phones or baby monitors or any of that other unlicensed stuff in the, in the DSRC band. So the belief is because it is a licensed band, you have as good a chance as you're ever going to get in a wireless technology to have reliability. At the end of the day, however, you, we have fading channels, we have shadowing, we have uh, lightning strikes. I mean, we, have, we can have industrial noise that spews energy out into the bands. You can never guarantee reliability 100% in a wireless network. But once the signal noise ratio gets to a certain level, then you have pretty good reliability. And obviously, we know how to predict reliability as a function of the signal to interference ratio or signal to noise ratio. So there's been a lot of tests. That's why they're doing field trials to see, to make sure that even in, in real world impairments, when two vehicles are approaching each other on a collision course, are you giving the driver enough time to, take a, to react and avoid a collision? And so far, the indications are yes. They're still going to be doing some more field trials over the next two years before 2016 to try to get a better handle on that. But it's a good question, right? We, we can't ever guarantee 100% reliability in a wireless link. But so in fact, what happens, I think, is vehicles will still have to have radar. They'll still have to have some other kinds of sensors around them that supplement DSRC. But DSRC can go so much further than a radar can. And an automotive radar is not going to be able to go 400 meters. And it's also not going to be able to hear what's going on with the car 300 meters ahead of you and there's 10 cars between you. One of the cool things about DSRC is you get information about all the cars around you, not just like with a radar of what's the car that's immediately in front of you that you're getting reflections off of. You can get information from a car 10 cars ahead of you with DSRC. And that, this picture kind of shows that. 
that <coughs> there's a car here, there's a big truck, truck here, and this car here, even though there's a big truck in front of it, actually knows what's going on with this car using DSRC. It's, this is sending out signals saying, I'm hitting my brakes. So car B here will know that car A is hitting its brakes even before the person driving the truck hits his brakes. And that's not something that you can visually see. It's not something that radar could easily do, but something that DSRC can do. Um, and at the bottom here I show that there are seven channels in the U.S. allocated for that. The one that's the most critical is channel 172. It's the Accident Avoidance and Safety of Life channel. Um, so when you go to build a DSRC system, you actually have to have two radios. You have to have one radio sitting on channel 172 continuously to monitor it. And then you, there's another radio that would actually scan the other six channels, monitoring them for traffic. It's like a radio, police scanner almost. But you're required under the, the mandate to have 100% reliability, 100% tuning reliability on channel 172. You're not allowed to switch that radio to any other band. You have to have 100% probability detection. So you can't share that radio with any other band. I shouldn't say 100% probability detection. The professor in me just realized that that's not a sensible statement. You have to have the radio tuned to that channel 100% of the time. Detection probabilities are obviously a function of signal noise ratio and interference. <coughs> So that's DSRC, and like I said, it's an interesting technology. It's kind of exciting. The thing that's, that's unique about it is it will be a government mandate, very likely, which means that it's a guaranteed market. <laughs> so you know there'll be a market for it. We'll sell probably, uh, in the U.S., uh, in by 2018 or 2019 when they launch this, we'll be selling about 20 million cars a year in the U.S., or about 100 million cars, 100 and 120 million cars globally by, by 2020. So... There's a guaranteed market. Guaranteed markets are good. Yes? So how is the position term? GPS. So we use GPS, and, and this is something we're, we're pretty good at at CSR. We take GPS and then we augment it, right? We have assisted GPS. We have dead reckoning. We have other kinds of indoor location that we can use if we're inside a parking garage. We can use Wi-Fi location, Bluetooth location, in addition to dead reckoning. But the idea is that we need to have, we need to have uh, position to within two or three meters, ideally, better if we can get it. Uh, so that's what GSRC requires GPS in the car, which for a GPS chip company is a good thing. Three meters accuracy is good enough for many applications, not all. And the one application it's not good enough for is, are you going to hit that pedestrian on the side of the road? Three meters there could be the difference between killing the pedestrian and not. And so to be effective as a, a way of avoiding killing pedestrians, you really need to get down to sub one meter accuracy. In an open highway with assisted GPS, we can quite often do better than that. And we think most of the, most of the work that's been done says, when you're in an urban area with all the big buildings around you and all the reflections, it's hard to maintain that sub one meter accuracy. When you're out on an open highway with good view of a bunch of satellites, and maybe you have assisted GPS signals coming in, then we should be able to get to one meter. But you're, you're correct uh, that the bicycle or pedestrian, three meters is uh, it's not good enough for them. Yes? Correct. I'll repeat the question too in a minute, but go ahead. Uh, in a metro situation uh, where in, in around uh, two, three intersections, there will be thousands of vehicles in the peak hour, and everybody is uh, giving this message 10 times a second, uh -huh. right? Other than 172 uh, channel, uh, other channels are almost like shared by everybody, right? Right. 10 times a second seems to me uh, pretty inadequate, thinking that there would be a lot of uh, message collisions and the loss of messages, right, in a, in a crowded I, situation. So it's a good observation. In fact, the, the companies that are working on DSRC are looking at what I would call adaptive messaging uh, to manage congestion. So in the beginning, we won't have enough DSRC vehicles on the road to be congested. But over time, because this is mandatory, we'll end up with potentially, like an, if you've ever been to Los Angeles, you know there's thousands of vehicles within 400 meters, potentially. Um, and so they've already been looking at 
I'll give you an example. If you have a mouse, a core wireless mouse, the wireless mouse, if it's not moving, doesn't send information very fast to save battery. But then when you move it around, it starts sending messages more quickly. So you can imagine the same kind of thing with DSRC, that if, if there's, the traffic's moving very fast, then you need more frequent updates. If things slow down, you need less frequent updates. And so there's been a lot of work done on congestion control algorithms that are a function of uh, speed and, and other factors. And there's some very nice published papers. Uh, there's a guy, a friend of mine from Toyota named John Kinney, who's published some papers on uh, how to do this congestion control uh, as we get more and more vehicles having this. So there are going to be some, it's not just going to be 100 millisecond uh, BSMs over time as we get more and more congested. Um, let me go ahead and finish and then we'll take questions because I guess we're kind of running low on time here. Um, obviously charging is wireless but it's at a different frequency band but it's kind of an interesting application so you don't have to plug the thing in. Um, but I, I want to spend a couple minutes here talking about we have a lot of RF systems and with potential for interference. And DSRC is going to be in this antenna that's on the top of the car called a shark fin antenna. And then inside the cockpit we'll have Wi-Fi. Uh, usually the antenna for Wi-Fi and Bluetooth is inside up, up under the dash by the head unit. Uh, and so we're going to have things using, sharing the 2.4 band. We'll have Wi-Fi in the 5 gigahertz band right next to DSRC. And then we have all these cellular bands transmitting at fairly high power either adjacent, right, adjacent to either Wi-Fi or Bluetooth. And so we as a company have invested a lot of effort in to try to make sure that our products anyway uh, behave well in, the, in this fairly severe environment inside the cockpit. And so we have actually a lab in Germany where we do a lot of uh, coexistence testing to make sure that when you put Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and DSRC and all these other technologies in the car that they all behave well and they don't desense each other, they don't interfere with each other. And we think that's a pretty important thing that we have to do to help our customers build successful products. So, in conclusion, there are going to be a lot of wireless technologies in the connected car of the future. The car is going to be, connect there are going to be devices inside the car connected to each other. There's going to be the car connecting infrastructure and their car is going to be connected to each other. There's going to be all this connectivity using a whole bunch of different wireless technologies. When we get to autonomous vehicles, vehicles that drive themselves, they're going to use radar, they're going to use GPS, they're going to use DSRC, uh, and maybe ultrasonics things to be able to guide the vehicle autonomously to its destination. Except in India, where I don't think autonomous vehicles are ever going to work. Uh, <laughs> That's that's true. If you guys can come up with an algorithm for an autonomous car that works in India, in Mumbai, Delhi, and Bangalore, you'll be able to sell that thing anywhere. Because if, if, if an autonomous vehicle works here, it'll work anywhere. Um, <laughs> so, so having all these wireless technologies in close proximity means that we as developers need to pay very careful attention to electromagnetic compatibility, electromagnetic interference, and uh, some systems are going to be critical to avoid, avoid collisions, so we have to pay a special attention to those because they're involved in safety. And <clears throat> we at CSR, of course, realize the automobile is not a giant smartphone. There are a lot of companies that are selling Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chips that were designed for smartphones. They're selling those into cars. But in fact, the automobile isn't a giant smartphone, and it's not a small living room either. It has its own special requirements. And so you as designers, and you know, whether you're using our chips or somebody else, to develop products for the automotive market, really need to, to look at doing proper analysis and design and verification testing to make sure that these multiple wireless technologies inside the vehicle all operate and coexist properly. I'm sorry, the question is, how, how's Google doing it? So uh, if, if, you, if you follow the Google self-driving vehicles, they have a, a rotating LiDAR system. It's a, laser, it's a laser scanning system. They also use sensors, ultrasonic sensors. I think in some cases they've experimented with radar sensors. Um, but they also have to have surveyed the area, right? So uh, if you take a Google self-driving vehicle, you can't just plop it on any highway anywhere and have it do its thing. They have to have previously mapped out the, the routes beforehand so it can get information about the route. Now, 
my, my friend, <laughs> my friend, I wish you were my friend, Elon Musk, the, when he announced the uh, self-driving or the, the autopilot for the Tesla Model S, it just has sensors that look around it. You know, they have ultrasonic sensors side to side, uh, and they have radar sensors uh, in the front, and I think it's an ultrasonic sensor in the back. So they're just looking to see what's immediately around it. So that's kind of, they call that autopilot, where it's just looking to see, are other people getting in my lane, am I staying in my lane, and do I need to slow down or can I speed up? And, and so it's kind of an intelligent cruise control thing. That's okay, but that won't, you can't just punch in a destination and have it take you there with that scenario. And that's where I think a lot of people want to get to is, you get in your car, you punch in where you want to go to, you push a button and the car drives you there. It's an incredible goal. And, and I think a lot of people are going to have a lot of trouble turning loose of that steering wheel and let the car drive itself. Uh, but that's where we're headed over the next 5, 10, 15 years. Very good. So the question is, what are the potential security issues? That's a very good question. So in DSRC, we have certificates. Every, every packet that's sent this, this 10 times a second packet it's, has a certificate associated with it. What we don't know yet is how you update those certificates on every vehicle to know which certificates are valid and which aren't. And it's kind of like having an email that has a certificate with it. So you have to have some way of establishing a database that has certificate validity. That's still being worked on. And I don't think they've announced how that's going to work out yet. But uh, the, what they don't want to do, uh, these basic safety messages in DSRC, they are not IP grant datagrams. They are actually what's called outside the context of a BSS, OBSS messages. So they have MAC addresses associated with them, but not IP addresses. And they are done just with a security certificate on them. They aren't encrypted. Um, what is the information that is uh, like sent along with the uh, po uh, uh, position coordinates? Like it's not just the blip. It's the size of the car. It's also the properties, right. the, probably the owner. Like it could be some privacy issues that can spring up. So since you're saying there's no, not even some encryption. So the, they're, uh, it's supposed to be anonymous. In fact, there's, some, uh, there's been some discussion about converting the MAC addresses to be an anonymized MAC addresses, where you rotate uh, basically pseudo-random MAC addresses. You don't have the same MAC address that could be associated with your vehicle. Um, so there is, there is work going on to make these MAC addresses anonymized. It doesn't have information about you as a specific owner, but as your car. But you're right. It does transmit the... the information about not only your speed and direction, but the dimensions of your vehicle. Obviously, if you're going to collide with a pedestrian or collide with another car, the size of your vehicle makes a difference. A little Tata compared to a big Land Cruiser makes a difference. Um, so there are some information transmitted about you. There is a lot of concern about the privacy, and, and in the rulemaking that's going on in the United States right now, that's one of the areas they're asking for comments on is how can we ensure that a stalker can't track your car around town. Um, and, and in the U.S., of course, already we have police that have cameras that take a picture of your car tag and run a check on it every time you drive past them. So they're already doing things to scan you, but we don't really necessarily want to make it worse. Uh, no, essentially, if uh, the car has to be connected to the infrastructure, then uh, if we don't send the personal information, it kind of defeats the purpose. And if we do, then it has to be encrypted. Well. If you're sending, you know, if you're going to be sending personal information, now the basic safety messages aren't meant to be personal to you. They're meant to be information about your car, whoever's driving your car. Uh, some, somebody meets with an accident, somebody's oh, driving, uh, you know, harshly or whatever. You, you bring up an interesting point, and, and this is kind of the Brave New World part of this. If you read 1984 or Brave New World, uh, you can imagine the insurance companies, and in Russia, we see this already. In Russia, everybody has a dashboard camera for insurance purposes. What's going to happen in, in places in, in a lot of countries, not just the U.S., there's going to be a black box inside the car. DSRC allows you to collect information about what's going on with all the cars around you, not just your car. And so when you're in a crash, your insurance company is going to be able to pull that black box out and see whose fault it was, who, was, who did what to whom and when, in those few seconds right before the collision. Um, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but it's a thing. <laughs> if it makes my insurance cheaper, it's a good thing. If, if, it, makes, if it makes it where my insurance company uh, says you were at fault and you have to pay and you're going to cancel your insurance, that's a bad thing.
So, so his question was, you know, if it, maybe, maybe if it, knowing that there's something, a problem with the other vehicle actually helps you. So if, the, if uh, there's in the, the information being sent out by DSRC says the other driver was being erratic or something or their blood sugar was off, then it helps you out on your insurance case. But there's, there's another interesting side to that, too, is um, if, you, um, uh, if you're in a crash, uh, then there, there is this issue of who owns that information. You know, can you stop your insurance company from getting that information? There, there are a lot of privacy and security issues here that I think are still being kind of worked on, and we'll see how it all turns out. But the fact is, it's going to be mandatory, and the government is really trying to assess what's the right level of privacy and security for this. We want it to be open enough that everybody's car can track everybody else's car, but not so open that people can do really bad things with it. And it's like anything. There's, there's always a two sides to the security and privacy issue. Uh, sir, uh, if there is any wireless system, this is here. I'm okay, there you are. <laughs> uh, uh, for any wireless system, uh, the biggest challenge is uh, to design wireless system for a reliable communication with a metal environment. So we know that uh, the car is uh, full of metal environment. And also, I think a uh, uh, few things which you have not mentioned here is uh, uh, the communication system can also be incorporated uh, uh, with the brake system, fluid system, mm -hmm. uh, that is a petrol, uh, that is the gas uh, fuel level indicator system, or your uh, back camera, everything. So in this metal environment, what is the challenge and what is the solution that you are uh, uh, looking in terms of hardware reliable communication between peer-to-peer -peer, peer -peer communication? So. Inside the vehicle, for example, the braking system has to be five nines or six nines kind of reliable, maybe more than that. And so you would never use wireless systems for braking, for example. You would have to use a wire, you would always have to, even if you did, went to uh, non-hydraulic braking, you would have to use a wired system for braking. Uh, I thought you were going to ask the question about what's to keep somebody from hacking into your braking system and messing with your braking system. That's a different question. Uh, but I don't know how much, we're probably out of time, right? I have, I have one question. Uh. Oh, your question was about hacking the car's brakes. There's already been, you know, there already is an OBD2 connector in the car, and you can, there have been cases of people playing into that and messing with the braking systems. If we're going to put wireless in a car, then you open up the ability of somebody outside the car with, you know, what I tell my students is I never underestimate the creative ability of graduate students with way too much spare time on their hands. <laughs> You know, it was graduate students that hacked DVDs. It was graduate students that hacked web. It's graduate students, their, peach, their graduate advisors aren't keeping them busy enough. They're going off and doing malicious things like hacking into braking systems on cars. So, <laughs> so it, it is an issue. And, and that's one of the things we're grappling with in the Wi-Fi Alliance is if we're going to put Wi-Fi in the car, how do you prevent somebody from breaking through the firewall and getting into the ACUs that control the engine and braking? And there has to be a very, very solid firewall there. Okay. Is there time for one more question? One last question, I'm told. Okay, so uh, I noticed in your uh, slide number 23, I think, uh, DSRC can, in the acute emergency situation, can take control. It's, it's up to the vendor to decide whether to do that or not. But there are already cars that, when they sense you're about to collide, will apply the brakes for you. So some companies are already doing that, Mercedes. Okay, so my question is that isn't it the uh, way you are actually opening up this, this entire system to really malintention hackers so they can create and I believe that if, if there is strong enough malintention, there is no system which is immune to hacking. That's right. I, I, I would agree with you that, that, like I said, I never underestimate the creative ability of graduate students. With it's not only graduate students. <laughs> right? It's not just there graduate students, but, but seem like the ones that are usually behind stuff like this. <laughs> right. So my question is, see, if the taking control part is not there, anyway, DSRC is saving life, but uh, maybe there would be an accident where a couple of uh, cars will be impacted. Right? right? Maybe a couple of lives will be uh, gone. And but by giving access to this system, you are actually opening up where they can create a havoc, pile up, 
uh, in intersection for other uh, secondary effect to uh, uh, occur, right? So, so it, it's a cost-benefit analysis, right? right? right. If 80% of the crashes out that happen are preventable, and you help stop three-fourths of those, but to go with that, you create new crashes that wouldn't have happened otherwise in 2% of the cases, is that worth it? And that's a societal question. Uh, we're going to try to make the systems as reliable as we can. We're going to make them where they are as fault tolerant as they can, that we have as few errors as we can. But I'm not going to say that every elect sophisticated electronic system never fails. It, it's certainly going to fail in some cases. And so it's a cost-benefit analysis. I think we're done. Yeah. Do we have more questions? Yeah. Can we have the mic, please? OK. So uh, in this uh, figure, how does the car B know that there's a car A in front of it? Because there's a truck in between, so. So how does the car, how does car A, a car A is broadcasting. No, yeah, so how does a car B know that there's a car A in front of it and because there's a truck in between, so how does it sense? So uh, this, to me, the, the, the software that's gonna go into DSRC is fascinating, right? Car B potentially has to be listening to dozens of beacons from dozens of cars around it to understand, try to establish, and it's really a common filtering problem. It's got to establish a track and a trend line for every vehicle around it to know, is that vehicle going to hit me or is it impacting me? So when car B is listening to all these beacons, and there are going to be potentially dozens of these beacons it's hearing, it's going to say, oh, car A, I know its position. It's in front of me. And it's starting to slow down very rapidly. So I better start thinking about slowing down too because it's 100 meters in front of me. Now, if I'm getting beacons from that truck, whether I'm getting beacons from that truck or not, I know that car A is 100 meters ahead of me and it's slowing down quickly. Uh, if I have an on-car, if I have a radar in the car, I'm going to know there's a big thing in front of me. It's going to be that truck. So, but in any case, the, the car B is going to hear beacons from A and know that A is slowing down quickly because there's a deer that ran out in front of it or something. And it's going to need to know that, hey, I better start paying attention to this and potentially take evasive action. I, I think that all of these could potentially augment it, right? And I mean, you, so Google, Google has laser radar, but there's also some cameras. Cameras, of course, are limited in, in what they can do uh, in rain or at night or in fog or things like that. So any vision system is going to not be as, not have the kind of long range capability that an RF system would. Thank you so much, Dr. Yep. Jim. All right, thank you. Can we have a huge round of applause for Dr. Jim for such an informative session? It was truly an honor to have you here.